Hey, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. We believe. Good evening, everybody. Great, great song. Thank you so much, David and the choir. If you got a Bible, I want you to grab it and turn together with me to the Gospel of Luke and the seventh chapter. Just turn there now. The Gospel of Luke and the seventh chapter. And we're going to continue this special teaching series called All In this weekend. This is week two. I told you last week, if you were here, that this is a time of year when we normally spend three or four weeks talking about what it means and what it looks like to be a good steward of the monies that God has entrusted to us. And certainly, an important part of that teaching is a challenge towards generosity, to be generous. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later tonight in this message, but not until we look at this incredible and powerful story in the life of Jesus that we find in Luke chapter 7. So, I don't want to waste any more time. If you got your Bibles open there or if you're even just still making your way there, I want you to go ahead and stand with me tonight in reverence and respect for God's Word like we always do as we read the Scriptures together. We make that a significant part of our service. And I want you to follow along as I read Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. I'm going to go all the way down through verse 50. It's a little bit of a lengthy text, a little bit longer than normal, but it's a great, great story that flows. It won't seem long to you. This is what it says. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put any oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. All right, there it is. You can be seated and we pray God's blessing on the reading and the hearing of his word. Let me just state the obvious as we begin to think about and talk about this text together tonight. It's beyond unusual for Jesus to have been invited into the home of a Pharisee. In New Testament times, I don't know if you are familiar with your gospels enough to know who Pharisees are, but in New Testament times, Pharisees were a strict group of religious fundamentalists who cared about one thing and one thing only— And that was keeping the Old Testament law in detail. I mean down to the smallest jot and tittle. They kept it in detail. Their lives literally revolved around following rules about what to do and what not to do. That was everything that you needed to know about them. Because of that, even though they were religious men, because of that, they became men who were religious but not spiritual at all. In other words, on the outside, they did everything right, but on the inside, they were a long, long way from God. They didn't have any tenderness in their hearts toward God. But the biggest reason why it was so unusual for Jesus to have been invited into one of their homes was they were some of, if not his most, outspoken critics during his earthly life and ministry. In fact, they went on to play a huge role in his crucifixion and his death. But on this particular evening, a Pharisee named Simon invited Jesus to dinner. And I want to describe to you for a moment what the setting would have been like 
in Simon's home. In the first century, in ancient days, affluent people, and Simon would have certainly fallen into the category of someone who was affluent, affluent people would have often had a large dining area, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) in the courtyard of their home. So this was kind of an outdoor setting. Might have been a home that flowed from the inside to the outside, but he had a dining area just outside of his home. And on special occasions, when somebody who was a distinguished person or a visiting rabbi, and that's what Jesus was, he was a rabbi, he was a teacher, when someone who was a distinguished person or a a visiting rabbi was invited for a meal, the people in the community would come to the courtyard to listen. They weren't invited in. They weren't invited to eat. They weren't included in the conversation but they were allowed to stand on the outside so that they could listen and they could observe. And that was the setting. And in that setting, this woman broke pretty much every social custom of the day and walked into the dinner party and approached Jesus. Now, verse 36, I don't know if you noticed this or not, said that When this happened, Jesus was reclining at a table. That's another thing that was very different in the first century than the way it is for you and me today. If I invited you over to my house for dinner, at the proper time, we would go into my dining room, we would pull chairs out from the table, and we would sit down at the table. Our feet would be under the table, just like it would be at your house. But in the first century, dining tables were low to the ground, and guests would lie on mats with their heads around and near the table. They would prop themselves up, for example, as they were laying on a mat, they would prop themselves up, for example, by leaning on their left elbow and eating with their right hand. You didn't know your kids were preserving biblical traditions when they ate in front of the television. (laughs) And it was while Jesus was in that very position that this woman who we're told in verse 37 had lived a sinful life in that town approached him. Just so there's absolutely no confusion among any of us tonight, there was only one way and one way only that a woman in a patriarchal society of that day could get the reputation for being sinful. And that is, she had lived a sexually promiscuous life. Truth be told, she was probably a prostitute. And everyone in that town knew it. They knew who she was, and they knew the kind of life that she had lived. But this woman was so, not just drawn, but so completely overwhelmed by Jesus that she broke social custom and approached him, and she did it in this incredibly demonstrative way. The text said that as she approached him, she began to cry, so her tears spilled onto Jesus' feet. I don't know if you noticed her or not, but when this is described in our text in verse 38, in my NIV Bible, it says that her tears wet his feet. The significance of that is, and this is not on the PowerPoint, but the significance of that is, is that the word that's used there in the original language of the New Testament for wet is the Greek word breko, which literally means rain. So her tears were pouring rain, like rain down on the feet of Jesus. I want you to get that picture in your mind. She was not just quietly crying. She was sobbing, sobbing. And she couldn't contain or control her tears. She ended up washing his feet with those tears. Don't miss the cultural significance of that detail because people in Jesus' day wore sandals because they walked, and because they walked on streets and roads that were made of dirt, that were dusty, their feet were always dirty. So one of the things that a host would do when he invited someone into his home is he would either provide a servant at the door with a basin of water and a towel to wash and dry the feet of his guests, or at the very least, if he couldn't afford a servant, at the very least, he would provide a basin of water and a towel so his guests could wash their own feet. But Simon had not done either one of those things. But this sinful woman, she washed, literally washed the feet 
of Jesus with her tears. And then the text said that she dried them with her hair. I don't want you to miss the cultural significance of that as well. Because in doing that, in drying Jesus' feet with her hair, she broke another social custom. The first one that she broke was just stepping in from the outer area of Simon's home and approaching Jesus the way she did. The second one is that women simply did not appear in public in the first century in the day of Jesus with unbound hair. They didn't do it, ever. It didn't happen. In fact, if you study the history of the day, you'll find that it was actually something for a woman to be in public with unbound hair was something that literally gave her husband legal grounds for divorce. That's how big a deal it was. But she didn't care. Again, so completely overwhelmed by the presence of Jesus, so captivated her. So captivated was she that nothing else mattered to her. She lost all sense of personal decorum. She lost all sense of personal appearance. And her behavior just got more scandalous from there. Because our story tells us that while she washed and dried his feet, she kissed them. She kissed his feet. Today in the Western world, for the most part, we interpret a kiss in a romantic way. In the days of Jesus, in the first century, a kiss was also a gesture of devotion and friendship. It's still that way in different parts of the world. Next weekend, uh, Brother Ajay Law from India will be here to preach When I see him for the first time next week, when I go to the airport, for example, to pick him up and he sees me, he will embrace me and he'll kiss me on the shoulder. It's a custom from his home that shows respect and friendship. It was similar to that in Jesus' day. When a guest would enter someone's house, the host would often place his hand on the guest's shoulder and give him a kiss. That represented peace and welcome, a kiss on the cheek or a kiss on the forehead, was a mark of respect and was such a big deal in ancient days that it would never, almost never, rather, be omitted, especially if you had a distinguished guest in your home or a rabbi, and remember if that's what Jesus was. But when Jesus entered the house of Simon, no kiss was given, not by Simon, but this woman didn't just kiss the feet of Jesus as she washed them with her tears and dried them with her hair, but she did it over and over and over again. I want you to try to imagine that scene for a moment. Over and over and over again. When I read this from my New International Version Bible, as much as I love my 1984 New International Version Bible, the English text really doesn't do justice to what was happening in the moment. The Greek word for kissed there, the single word kissed in my NIV Bible is the word katafileo, which describes a very intense action, not just of kissing, but of embracing. Embracing to the point where you didn't want to let go. That's the scene. We're in Luke chapter 7. I'm sure most of us here tonight are familiar with the story of the prodigal son. You just have to turn several pages to the right to Luke chapter 15 to read it. You know the story about the man who had the two sons, and the younger son said, give me my inheritance now, and the father granted his request. He went off and he wasted it all on what the Bible calls riotous living until he had nothing, and when he found himself about as far down as you can get, he decided, I'll go back home and just basically beg for my father's forgiveness and ask to be one of his hired servants. But you know what happened. The father saw his son coming in a distance. And remember what happened. He ran to him, and he threw his arms around him, and he embraced him, and he kissed him. And it's the same word there, katafileo, when that father who thought his son was lost found him again and embraced him. What would you be like with one of your children if you thought they were gone forever, and then all of a sudden they were at your door? How would you respond? Respond. That's the way this woman was. A 
as she washed and dried and kissed the feet of Jesus over and over and over again. And then she opened up, my NIV Bible says, an expensive alabaster jar of perfume and used it to anoint his feet. Actually, I don't like the way this is rendered in my NIV Bible. I don't know what you're reading from tonight, but it would probably be more accurate to say that she opened up a flask or a vial of perfume. It was not uncommon for women in ancient days to wear something like that around their necks, especially a woman like her, if it's true, that she was a prostitute. This was also another sign of deep respect and devotion to a guest that was in your home. Whenever a special guest entered your home, the host would usually welcome him by anointing his forehead with a small amount of rose oil. But again, just like with washing Jesus' feet, just like with a kiss of welcome, Simon didn't do this when Jesus entered his home, but the woman did. Can you just even picture in your mind for even a moment how incredible this scene must have been as it unfolded right there in the courtyard of Simon's home? I thought about this for days. I thought about what I might be able to say to drive home how shocking and how surprising And how dramatic and how emotional and how tender this moment was. But I couldn't find the words. So just think about it for a moment. Again, try to picture it in your mind. This broken, sinful woman, somebody who was an outcast, becoming so overwhelmed by the presence and the reality of Jesus that she could not contain herself. She was compelled to respond in a demonstrative way with absolute abandon. Imagine what it would have been like if you had been there and you were looking on and you had seen this unfolding in front of you. Imagine if something like that were to happen here in church in one of our services. And someone became so overwhelmed by the message of Jesus, by the, by the presence of Jesus in our lives by the call of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, the mercy and the grace of Jesus, that they became so emotionally overwhelmed that they were compelled to come down and just weep. Just weep. Losing all composure. How do you think that would make you feel? I think we would probably find ourselves somewhere between being deeply moved to feeling very awkward in the presence of something like that. But that's not the way Simon, the Pharisee who had invited Jesus into his home, felt. Because if you remember the story, his response was to look at all of it with a very critical eye. And then he thought to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And next comes one of the very best parts of the story, because while the story, as it's presented here in Luke's gospel, makes it seem like Simon was keeping all of that to himself, the text literally says that he said to himself, Jesus knew what was going through his mind. How many of you know that Jesus knows everything? Nothing can be hidden from him. And so, He startled Simon by saying, Simon, I have something to tell you. And then he told him this brief story. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? And Simon replied in verse 43, he said, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus said, you have judged correctly. And then Jesus did something that must have felt very dramatic in the moment. Because he moved from speaking directly to Simon toward the woman who was probably still right there at his feet. And, she, and he went on to say, Simon, do you see this woman? 
I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. And if the evening weren't shocking enough already, Jesus did something even more shocking after that. He turned to that woman and he said, your sins are forgiven. If you look back at verses 49 and 50, you know how shocking that was because it says the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, before we get any further, let's just all agree together tonight that Simon failed miserably in his response to everything that happened that night. Everything that happened from the time that Jesus entered his home all the way up to the sinful actions of this woman, or the actions, rather, of this sinful woman. He didn't treat Jesus with the respect that he deserved, and when this woman showed her incredible, uninhibited love for Jesus, instead of being deeply moved, he was just critical that Jesus allowed it to happen But he didn't count on Jesus being able to see into his heart, which led to Jesus' story. Now, we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us what happened after that with regard to Simon. We don't know anything about Simon beyond his response to Jesus' question when Jesus told the story and said, which one of them will love him more? We know the other guests were surprised because Jesus told this woman that her sins were forgiven. Pharisees believed that only God could forgive sins. Not even a rabbi, not even the greatest rabbi could do that. And if you know anything about the life of Jesus, you know that that's something he did on more than one occasion, and it got him into trouble on more than one occasion with these religious leaders. And then he told the woman, go in peace because your faith has saved you. I want to give you two lessons to learn from this story, this incident The first one is this, and you can write it down next to number one in your insert. I read this story, which, by the way, is overwhelming to me. Am I the only one here tonight? Is, is, that, is, is that just the most incredible thing that you've ever read? I read this story, and the first thing that stands out to me is this truth. The more you understand forgiveness the more you love. The more you understand forgiveness, the more you love. I don't for a moment believe that this was the first time this woman had ever been in the presence of Jesus. I think that she had been around him before. I think that she had heard him before. I think she had seen him before. I think she had become familiar with him before. And when she heard that he was going to be at Simon's house and she knew that setting and she knew she might have an opportunity to connect with him, That's exactly what she did. And this story, I'm going to make another application a little bit in a few minutes, but I want you to understand that I understand that this story, first and foremost, is a story about forgiveness. This is all about forgiveness, the kind of forgiveness that we receive from God. That's the context of this story. In fact, you should write that in the margin of your Bible in Luke chapter 7. Next to verse 36, this passage is headed in my Bible with the words, Jesus anointed by a sinful woman, and you should write next to that, forgiveness. This is all about forgiveness. In fact, there are three specific lessons taught about forgiveness in this story. The first one is this. We all have much to be forgiven. We all do. One of the things that really stands out to me is After Jesus told Simon the story about the two men who owed the money, one 500 denarii and one 50, but neither could pay, and so the person they owed the money to canceled the debt, Jesus said in verse 47, as the end result, as he brought that story back in application to the woman, he said, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. And I... looked at that this week, and I realized that would be a statement that's easy to misunderstand. That's a verse that could easily be misunderstood by someone. Because Jesus isn't saying that 
We commit many sins so we can love God more, that we should, we should go out and sin more and more and more so that we can somehow love God more. What Jesus is doing is he's trying to teach Simon a lesson about forgiveness, about his own need for forgiveness. And that's a little bit easier to see if you understand that the word for, when Jesus said, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. It's easier to understand when you see that the word for has the sense of wherefore. And so, in fact, what Jesus is saying, he's saying, I tell you, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, wherefore, or as a result, she loved much. Make sense? And that gives you a little bit more clarity in why she was so compelled to do what she did for Jesus because she knew she had been forgiven for so much. She knew that she had lived a sinful life, a sexually promiscuous life, the life of an outcast, someone who was unworthy, and yet she had been forgiven. And so she demonstrated how much she loved Jesus for that forgiveness in the way she washed his feet and kissed his feet and anointed his feet. But Simon didn't get it. Instead of watching the actions of this woman and allowing them to teach him about how he should respond to Jesus and the forgiveness that Jesus came to offer, he made the mistake of just focusing on her sin. And when he focused on her sin, I have no doubt in my mind that he compared himself to her. And when he compared himself to her, he came to the conclusion, she's a sinner, I'm not. She's a prostitute, I'm a Pharisee. And so it never even registered to him that Jesus came to forgive sin. But we all, all have much to be forgiven. And just because your sin is different from someone else's doesn't mean it's not sin. And we make a mistake sometimes when we think that God looks at us and He grades the quality of our spiritual lives on the curve because we all, we all know that none of us are perfect, but it's easy to look around and say, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm way better than that guy. But God doesn't grade on the curve. We all have much to be forgiven, and it is a big mistake. It is a huge mistake to somehow believe that we need God's grace less than someone else does. Simon needed to be forgiven every bit as much as this woman, but he was too smug to acknowledge it, just like there are millions of people in the world today who believe that they're basically good and that being basically good is good enough when it comes to God, but it's not. And here's the problem. People who think that way will never be able to receive God's forgiveness because they'll never bring themselves to the point where they can acknowledge their own sinfulness. And you can't become a Christian until you admit your sin. That's the first step. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he began with the Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know what, you know what he means by poor in spirit? He says, Blessed are those who, who, ha, who, un, who recognize their own spiritual poverty, who, have a, uh, who understand that they're poor in spirit because they're spiritually impoverished. And only then can you receive the riches of God's forgiveness. Simon didn't get it. The sinful woman did. It was obvious, but Simon didn't get it. But the truth is, the first lesson is we all have much to be forgiven. All of us. I'll put myself at the very top of the list. We all have much to be forgiven. The second lesson about forgiveness is this. And this is so simple, but it's powerful. If you want to be forgiven, you can be. If you want to be forgiven, you can be. God's forgiveness is not based on how much we deserve it. It's based on His love, His sacrifice, and whether or not we want it. So the pertinent question is, for all of us at some point in our lives, do you want to be forgiven enough to ask for it? God won't force it on you. Do you want to be forgiven enough to ask for it? Because if you go to God in sincerity and you ask to be forgiven of your sins, He's going to forgive you every time. How many of you know that? Every time. Every time. Something we can count on, and we can count on it because it's the, it's the overflow of the love and the grace and the mercy of an infinite God. One morning this past week, I was in the middle of trying to finish this message over the course of a, what turned to be a out to be a kind of a crazy week. And one morning, 
I was having a time of prayer. And I don't know about you, but every time I pray for any length of time, I always come to a place in my prayers where I confess my sin and I ask God for forgiveness. And as I was doing that and I was confessing my sin, I was asking forgiveness for something that I have asked forgiveness for over and over and over again in the past. Not because I somehow think that God didn't forgive me, but because I did it again. And right in the middle of that prayer, I had this thought that my confession seemed a little bit disingenuous because I had said the very same thing and asked for the very same forgiveness over and over and over again in the past. But here's the deal, folks. Why it might have felt that way, while it might have felt that way to me in the moment, it did not feel that way to God because of his perfect character. And when we have those feelings, we need to remember words like this from 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, where John writes and says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What matters is the quality of our heart when we're confessing. If you come to God with a humble and an honest heart, you ask him for forgiveness, forgiveness is what you're going to get. And it's what you'll continue to get. There's a great passage a little bit later in Luke's gospel, Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Jesus is doing some teaching, and he says, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Now, here's the lesson from that, the simple lesson. God expects you to forgive others without limit. You know why? Because that's how God forgives you. Now, that doesn't mean we have a license to sin. Anybody who thinks that way is completely missing the point. We never have a license to sin. Sin is because sin is always bad. Sin causes pain. Sin wrecks lives. Sin breaks the heart of God. But he still forgives us because his forgiveness is not based on us. It's based on him. And as imperfect as we are, he is perfect. The third lesson on forgiveness is this. Accepting forgiveness is an act of faith. The very last part of the story, Jesus looked at this woman and said, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so receiving that forgiveness is an act of faith because when you, when you receive the forgiveness of God, you don't wait around for some feeling to confirm it. You ask for it by faith, and then you accept it by faith. Now, you might walk away feeling like a weight or a burden has been lifted off of you, but you might not, but regardless of how you feel, God has forgiven you, and you have to accept that by faith. Simon missed that. He missed that completely. The more you understand about forgiveness, the more you love. Let me give you a second truth, and I'm going to have to do this quickly. The second thing that I see in this story is that the more you love, the more you give. I want you to look back with me at a very specific part of this story, verses 37 and 38. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Mark Batterson, who's a pastor in Washington, D.C., writes about this passage, and he says, the alabaster jar of perfume was pure nard, a perennial herb that is harvested in the Himalayas, half a liter of it, no less. And the jar itself was probably a family heirloom. It might have even been her dowry. Plain and simple, it was her most precious possession. How ironic, yet appropriate, that the perfume used in her profession as a prostitute would become a sign of her profession of faith. The bottom line is, when she broke open that alabaster jar, she was giving everything to Jesus. It was her way of showing that she was all in It was an expression of love because the more you love, the more you give. Now, I'm going to reiterate again what I told you a few minutes ago, and I want you to not miss this. This story is a story about forgiveness. Does everybody understand that? This is a story about forgiveness. In fact, say that with me. This is a story about forgiveness. That's the lesson here. 
But at the same time, there's another principle here that I think can be related to our giving. I can find multiple reasons in the Bible why we should give back to the Lord. As he gives to us, as he blesses us, as he entrusts money and possessions to us, I can find multiple reasons in the Bible why we should give a portion of that back to him. Let me just mention a couple real quickly. Number one, giving is a part of having a sound plan for stewardship. Giving is a part of having a sound plan for stewardship. I don't know if beyond the gospel message and just the teaching, the teaching for understanding and application of the scriptures, if there's anything that I'm more passionate about as a teacher of the Bible than what the Bible has to say about being a good steward of what God has entrusted to us. And I'm talking in this context about money and possessions. I believe so deeply in this. And that's why over the years, if you've been here for any length of time, over the years you've heard me talk about this on a number of occasions. And I've always given you the same simple plan for being a good steward because we all have to have a plan for stewardship. If you don't have a plan for the way you handle God's money, then let me tell you something, you're in a bad place. If you don't have a plan, if you cannot say with integrity tonight, I have a thoughtful plan for handling the monies and the possessions that God has entrusted to me, then you are falling short. You're coming up short. I've told you that there's a simple plan from the book of Proverbs. There's four parts to it. The first part is to keep track Proverbs 13, 16 says, Every prudent man acts out of knowledge, but a fool exposes his folly. Every one of us should know. We should keep track of how much money comes in, how much goes out, where it's going, what's happening with all of our money. If you don't have, a, if you don't have some kind of plan for keeping track of what God has entrusted you, I'm going to say it again. You're in a bad place. You're falling short. You're being foolish. If I can just be that straightforward. The second part of the plan for stewardship from Proverbs is we should plan ahead. Number one, keep track. Number two, plan ahead. Proverbs 21.5 says, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as uh, haste leads to poverty. The plans, the plans, the plans of the diligent lead to, to uh, profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. There needs to be a plan for the way we handle God's money. We need to be able to know everything that we need to know about, how much comes in, how much goes out. There needs to be a plan in place for the way we deal with it. That means we should all have some level of budget, some kind of spending plan, whether it's really detailed and in-depth or whether it's general, there should be some kind of a plan in place for the handling of God's money. And if you don't have a plan, you're being foolish. The third part is we should save consistently. Proverbs chapter 13 and 11 says, dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. We should have a plan to save money. Every one of us should have a plan to save money. We shouldn't be foolish about that. We shouldn't presume upon the future. We shouldn't keep saying, tomorrow I'll do this, or tomorrow I'll do that, or tomorrow. There should be a plan in place today. And listen to me, I don't care how old you are. I don't care how old you are. You should start today. There should be a plan for saving money. And the fourth thing we need to do, according to Proverbs, we need to give habitually. We need to give habitually. We need to be generous with our giving. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. This is simple. Giving is part of a, having a sound plan for stewardship. We need to keep track of what we have. We need to plan ahead with what we have. We need to save consistently with what we have. And we need to give habitually. We need to give a portion of what we have back. Another reason why I think the Bible tells us that we should give is because giving breaks the power of money. Write that down in your notes. Giving breaks the power of money. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, I think this verse is going to be on the screen. It says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I am so deeply disappointed that I'm running out of time and I don't have time to really talk about this on any level. But this is a, do you see this? Do you see how serious this verse is? Look at it on the screen. Is it up there? Look at it on the screen. It says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Note this next part. Some people eager for money have, what have they done? Wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money of itself is an amoral thing, but it is also a dangerous thing with, in our lives when we don't have the right attitude toward it. 
more than almost any other thing, we're susceptible to the temptation to fall in love with money and let money draw us away from the things that are most important in life. But let me tell you something, nothing breaks the power of money in our lives like holding on to it loosely and being willing to give it away. The third thing I wrote down here in my notes is giving gives us the opportunity to lay up treasure in heaven. Write that down. You're probably familiar with these words from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. You know, there are only two things that are eternal. And those things are, number one, the Word of God. And number two, your soul, my soul, the souls of people, the souls of men. That's it. That's it. So we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven when we give monies to ministries and missions that reach out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people locally and globally. I want to tell you, I've not done a good job of this in the past, but I want to tell you for just a moment a little bit about the way we give away the money that you give here at Mount Pleasant we have, a, we have a significant budget that we operate with every year. I told you last week, how can you walk on our campus and not know that it takes money to do ministry on the level that we do it? You'd be naive to think otherwise. We have a significant budget. A lot of that covers operating expenses. We've got a lot of property. We've got a lot of buildings. We've got a big staff. We've got operational costs like that. But beyond that, in this, in this budget year we're involved in right now, we operate by a fiscal year, not a calendar year. Our fiscal year goes from July 1st to June 30th. In this current fiscal budget year, we'll give away a little bit more than $1.7 million to our local and global mission partners. It, actually, it'll be more than that. I just don't have any other way of, of, of tracking some of the other expenses because they're spontaneous expenses. For example, not long ago. Yeah, that's something to celebrate. For example, not long ago, we, sent just, we just sent a, spontaneously sent a check for $50,000 to India to help with children's fund because we didn't have enough, they didn't have enough money to care for all the orphans and the fatherless that they had there that they were trying to minister to. Here's a really brief snapshot of what that looks like. We support global mission partners in India, Poland, Mexico, Egypt, and Canada. In addition, we support mission partners that have influence all throughout Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. Over the past 18 months, we've played a role in launching churches in 13 countries in India, Poland, Mexico, Canada, Egypt, Estonia, Romania, Hungary, Czech, the Czech Republic, Cyprus, New Zealand, Myanmar, and Thailand. Churches in 13 different countries. In addition, we've given money that's provided training for Christian leaders in 95 different countries. That's because we have three basic goals with the missions money, the global missions money that you give. The first goal is leadership development. So we go places and we support missions that develop leaders, indigenous leaders, to go back to their homes to represent Christ and plant churches and minister to people. Listen, the day when you and I were young, we, we had this image of missionaries being white Americans who gave up everything in this country to go to another country and serve. And that sometimes happens today, but that is not the model that happens most often today. The model today is to train people in their own countries where they live to serve. And we are doing that in 95, representing 95 different countries every single year, raising up leaders we give money to reach and provide for refugees, to establish medical, dental clinics, and hospitals, to provide clean water systems where no clean water is available, to provide food for hungry people, homes for the homeless, care for unwanted children and orphans, money that rescues young girls from sex trafficking. trafficking. We teach indigenous people different trades to give them a hope and a future, build and support schools, providing a Christian-based education, and we provide a variety of different levels of disaster relief. And I'm just... I am barely scratching the surface. That's globally. Locally, we are involved in the Impact Center, providing food and, food and clothing every week, helping women with difficult and unwanted pregnancies. We build homes through Habitat for Humanity. We break the, help break the cycle of poverty, unhealthy lifestyles, and family dysfunction through supporting Shepherd Community. We help 
women who need to be rescued and redeemed and restored from degrading lifestyles. We support Bible clubs in local schools so kids can hear the truth of the Scriptures. Sometimes kids who don't have any other church opportunity, it's the only place they ever get to hear the truth of the Scriptures, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And let me tell you something, every time we do that, you know what we're doing? We're storing up treasures in heaven. And if that was the only reason why we gave, I think that's reason enough. Now, there's a lot of other things I could list, but I'm just going to stop there, and I'm just going to give you one more, and we're going to bring this to a close. Brian, I'm, I'm, I'm over time, so get up here and hold me accountable. <laughs> I want you to write this down. Giving is a tangible way to express our love for Jesus. I don't want to misstate anything about this incredible story we looked at tonight from Luke chapter 7. And I want to say it again. This is a story about forgiveness, the availability of forgiveness, the power of forgiveness. But when that woman broke open that perfume, she was giving Jesus everything that she had as a gift of love. And what she did was motivated by love. It wasn't a gift to try to pay for or earn something that Jesus had done for her. It was a sacrifice of love. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. Being a good steward, which includes giving giving generously, that is huge for me. That is one of the most important things in my life personally, on a purely personal level. It is huge for me. It's a significant part of my life, Sandy and my life. And I could tell you, I could bore you with personal story after story of how I believe God has blessed that commitment and how God has provided for us and given to us over the years I can also tell you that I believe in giving out of love and thankfulness for what Jesus has done for me. Because I don't know where my life would be today apart from Jesus. How about you? I look back at the last 58 years of my life, and I don't know where I would be apart from Jesus. And giving is a tangible way to demonstrate how much we love him. Not to try to earn what he's given us or to pay him back or to ever deserve it, but out of nothing more than pure thankfulness. The more you understand about forgiveness, the more you love. The more you love, the more you give. Father in heaven, I am so deeply thankful for this story and the example of this woman who lost complete concern about herself in this moment. 